Hey everyone, so I am here, good, to talk, so the, the title of this talk is called Code Collage, which is sort of this kind of pretentious artsy thing, but I mean, what I really want to talk about is Unix philosophy. So this is one of my favorite philosophers, it's uh, Diogenes of Sinope, this guy's amazing, but there really are these sort of, um, these, these higher level kind of platonic forms in code that I think are really amazing. And uh, so just a little bit, this is uh, the company I started, Browserling, whoops. Um, it's just like a cross-browser testing site. I mean, mostly these days it's just to subsidize my experiments, but it's, we, we do have a lot of great stuff planned. Um, so I was just in Lisbon and, and this guy, uh, Max Ogden, um, Gave people a fish. It was really, it was really excellent. But it got me thinking. Yeah. So Max Ogden has this really cool website uh, called callbackhell.com, and uh, I think it's a really great example to start this sort of, this sort of discourse on what makes good code and what makes good art because there's there's a lot of similarities. So, for instance, if we see some code like this, right? This is sort of the canonical, I took this exactly from his website. This is the canonical sort of um, terrible callback hell where you just like have this, this arrow pointing off to the right in the distance. Um, it's, it's because we, we take our state and we just nest it and we keep nesting and we go all the way out and it's totally unreadable. But So I wrote a piece of software that lets you take, whoops, take those and put them in a more of a graphical form. So we're not really looking at the code anymore. We're looking at sort of a, a graphical representation of, of what it entails. Um, so for instance, in this, it, this image viewer thingy gives each nested statement a new color. So you see like the banding pattern. And the more, the more of the color you see, the probably the worse the code is. So it, it's, it's a great way to sort of visualize a code base on a higher level. And so um, if we go just to the rest of this stuff on callback hell, I've got a nice little sequence here for that. So um, here we can, we can have a, just a, a simple form, and you know, we can have this on submit thing that's kind of ugly because it's got you know, these nested callbacks in it. Um, you can rewrite those so that you actually name your functions, and then you can split them out, which is really nice because you're, you're being explicit, but really, the really beneficial thing about it is when you start doing modules. So if we just could require a module, we wouldn't have to do any of that. We could sort of push it off to the side and just make a module that just does one thing. And that's a really important thing in, in Unix philosophy. It's just do one thing, ideally exactly one thing, unless you can't for whatever external constraint. But so you, you have a module that looks like this, and you like exports.submit at the end there, or you module that exports, and it's really amazing. Like I really fell in love with this pattern in Node because it means that you can just do one thing really well, and then you can share it on NPM. And what's really cool also is that when you do that, you, you start, like this is the first one, right? We have, we have some nesting, we have this color pattern. We can, you know, this is where we name it, but that's just an incidental step to get to this point where it's all the same color because we're only ever going one indentation level deep. But I think the most important thing also is that, you know, this, none of these pieces are very big either. It's, you know, it's 15, 20 lines tops. And I think that that, that is really the sweet spot, you know, maybe, maybe all the way up to 100 lines, but not much more than that um, for modularity. And so here is, here's both of the pieces of code as the final step. So we can actually split things up into separate modules, push them on NPM, and it's really great because you go from this to this. So we can get a little meta here and actually look at the code that generated this. So uh, the first thing as I was creating these examples was, well, I, I find myself doing this pattern where I, where I call child process.spawn all over the place, but I typically only want to check the exit status to see if it's, if it's non-zero. And if it is a non-zero, then I want to just like, make an error message and put all of the standard error into the error message. That would be really handy. So that is all that this function does. We can actually zoom out a bit to get more of like the higher level uh, what it's doing. It's very short. It's, let's see, it's 47 lines total. And so the, the next piece was, well, 
Um, maybe I don't just want to see one piece of code rendered. I want to see the entire Git history rendered, animated, which I will go to in a second. So here I've got this second, this second module that just uh, uses the git log command and, and parses all of the commits. And uh, if, well, I can't quite run that, but, well, <laughs> so when, when all of this module does, it's one thing is that it just takes git log and it just gives you objects instead of like the standard git format. It's very simple. And the, the final thing that I needed was a module to actually render the things with Canvas. This one is unfortunately the, a bit long. It's 108 lines, but that's, that's sort of the upper bound usually for most of the, the modules that I make. You know, it, it, so it uses uh, two modules, Canvas, and which is by TJ Holowaychuk. It's just a wrapper in Node for the native Canvas browser API. And Falafel is just a, a small wrapper I wrote around a Sprema.js, which is really great because it lets you take JavaScript, parse the abstract syntax tree, the AST, so that you can get all the tokens. And that's how I was doing, um, like, having the different colors for the different bands in the code. So the next piece is called git file. There's this really excellent command in git called git show. And uh, all, of, all that this file does is it's a really simple wrapper around the git show command. And all you do is you specify the commit reference so that could just be a commit hash, a colon, and the file name. And that lets you like, go back in time to any, the state of any file at any particular time. So we can just have a really simple wrapper. And combined with the git history, we can see what any file looked at uh, for the whole course of an entire program, like how it evolved. Like, what's its, what's its backstory, basically? But that's not quite enough. We actually need a a final piece to really tie it all together. This one is called Git Detective. And it analyzes the, ab uh, it analyzes the, the module dependency graph of, of a file in a Git history. So you can have this historical file, and this program will, will analyze the abstract syntax tree, but it actually looks at the require graph. So you require a file, that file will also be included, and its, and its sub-dependencies will be included. That doesn't parse down to modules, but it just looks at the files in a project, which, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit. But this one is not very long either. It's, well, it's 114 lines. And then, once we have all of these pieces, all that we need to do is turn the, the, Git, uh, the Git detective data structure, just with a really simple map, um, into this piece. Then we can finally run this program. So this is just the coloring logic and the program source. Now this is really cool right here. We take the history and uh, we pipe that to our detective grapher. And then we can just create a write stream and write all of these files to disk. So that is the entirety of this program, 36 lines. And let's see. So if I go here to, this is the entire history of the Browserify project. So I'll give it a second to load. Yeah. And so with, with all of these tiny pieces, we're able to look at the entire history of our project. This is all the Git commits. This is like 620 odd commits, of the history of the project. And here in a little bit, you'll, you'll start to see uh, several files. There we go. So, this is like breaking things out into module and into separate files. Now you might notice one thing: it's it's not continuously growing by any means. Like there's a lot of discontinuity there, and that's where I've refactored things out into separate, very tiny pieces. So like uh, detective, which which I showed uh, an example of using get with, is is one of those discontinuities where it jumps back a step. And um, so this is the history of Browserify. I also did this for. Dnode, which is another one of my projects. It's a basic RPC system. And this, this one tells a similar story, right? It's, it's the, the basic layout, you know, but it's, it tends to be rather small, right? And, and there, there are discontinuities, and sometimes it jumps up a bit, and then it jumps back usually, because I'll split that out into a separate module. But one of, one of the big lessons here, I think, that I've come across is that the best thing that can be said of any piece of software is that it's too small. <laughs> if people are complaining, and I've had people complain at me about this very thing, that your software is too small, you're doing something very right. 
<laughs> like, erring on the side of being too small is, is really beneficial <laughs> for a number of reasons. So, firstly, um, like, project modules tend to grow over time. Software tends to get bigger. And, like, especially with, you know, edge cases and things. But if you start at the small, then you'll have room for that later. Also, it, it makes things a lot more reusable and, and modular. Um, so speaking of modularity, <laughs> uh, I have some examples here that I think really demonstrate this in really practical terms about exactly how we can start using these little pieces to build systems that actually do quite sophisticated things, which should be really amazing. So uh, the first thing, oh, and I have pictures for some of this besides the Max Ogden fish. Which is great. Um, yeah, it's, it's all about technical debt. OK, here's the image that I wanted to show. So the first module is just this silly thing that the, the atom is an event emitter, and the little box with the conveyor belt is a readable stream. And all it does is it changes, like, it gives you the opposite that you gave into it. So if you give it an event emitter, you get a readable stream. If you give it a readable stream, you get an event emitter. Really simple stuff. That is the only thing that it does, and it's a module. So. We can start using these re reusable modules. And uh, you know, all we need to do is we create a new event emitter. And we give, that, uh, we give that event emitter to emit stream. And then we get back um, just a stream that we can listen for data on. So here we'll just emit some data, beep boop. And um, we, can, we can then use the, uh, another module called JSON stream to actually pipe that somewhere, so we'll, we'll pipe it to the stringify stream. Pipe is really amazing. It, it lets us really compose together things in a, in a super excellent way. So let's see. This one is 05. So yes, here we've just got uh, data that's con continuously being output by this program. Um, but what's really cool whoops, is that we can we can start piping it um, to places like process.standardout, for instance. But the really cool thing about, about these, these modules that just use really simple interfaces, like streams, is that we can make servers, simple servers that just talk on the network. So here, just with like what three extra lines, we've now made this simple streaming interface a TCP server. So if we run that, then with curl, we can actually, or netcat, I guess, we can connect on a port. And cool, we get the same data that we got on standard out. I think that's a really, really compelling reason to use these, these different interfaces. Um, so emit stream is really great because uh, you can use these streaming abstractions. Like, like here, um, we'll actually just be listening for events now. So uh, this, this server connects to itself just to demonstrate um, how you can really compose these together. So this is example 10. Make that big. Ah, cool. So this, this server just connected to itself, and it's now parsing the data, but in a streaming way. So for instance, if you only use things like JSON parse, um, you'd have to like make a, line, a new line terminated protocol to parse things or, or something silly. But we can do a little bit better with streaming abstractions like this. So the next thing I have in, in mind, um, that was kind of boring, I think. But this thing actually is rather practical. So let's make our own socket I.O. Why not, right? Because you know, maybe we don't need all of the opinions that something as big as socket I.O. has in store for us. We, we need like separate reconnect logic. We want to actually turn off the debugging, which is sort of annoying sometimes, in a different way. Or we just really want to layer our abstractions. So we can totally do that using, using these really simple modules that only do one thing. So here, we just create an HTTP server and just like have it serve some static content. Uh, we can use this module called SHU, which is just a very simple streaming wrapper on top of SOX.js. It's like 30 lines. It's really great. And the cool thing about SHU is when you create a server, all you get is a stream. There's no like special interface on top of that that's, that's additional. It's just a really simple thing, and you just hack it into your server with like a couple of extra lines. So here, with this example, we'll just write, we'll write some output. Um, we'll, we'll write a string and to um, the, the browser stream. So 
this, this is a, a WebSocket polyfill, a SoxJS, I should have said. So the browser side of this is similarly simple. It's actually even simpler, because all you do is wi with a, a module system like Browserify, you can just do require shoe. And then all you get is a stream. This is really amazing. Like, you just get a stream, and you can do whatever you want with that, like listen for data events and uh, render the text content. So if we run this server, it should be on localhost 8050. And I have to make it big. OK, the first one. Sweet. So zeros and ones, we're getting data back. That's cool. It's, it's doing exactly what it should. And what's really, really more amazing than that is that we can extend this example. So here's the server again. And now, let's see. Now instead of um, just writing data directly, we can use that uh, uh, emit stream abstraction that I just talked about. So. So here, instead of stream.write, we'll do um, ev.emit upper. And that can just be an event. And um, so the thing about these abstractions is you need to, you have control over the serialization part of it yourself. You're not, you're not letting another library do that for you. But it's really easy to plumb in different kinds of abstractions. So here we'll use JSON stream. But you could use other, other modules, like stream serializer, or you could write your own. It's, it's really great, because you have all of that control. And all you need to do is we'll take this emit stream abstraction and we'll pipe it to a serialization library that just does that one thing. That's very important. So we do all these things. We, we pipe it to our, our stringifier. We pipe it to the stream. And then we should just uh, be able to run this. So here I've just got some intervals that, that uh, out, out emit to events. So if I do run to.js, we'll go to the second example. Cool. So now, instead of just outputting data directly, we can output data through an event emitter, which is great. But it gets better because, uh, whoops, because we can use uh, even crazier abstractions that just do their one thing. Like for instance, uh, there's this this concept called multiplexing and and demultiplexing, where you can take multiple streams and pack them into a single stream. Like, this is really great in the browser, where you only have like a WebSocket connection. And you, you want to be able to, to layer multiple kinds of abstractions into that single WebSocket connection. So there's this really great library by Dominic Tarr called MuxDemux that, that handles this really well. So MuxDemux is really simple to use. You just require MuxDemux in the browser or the server. It doesn't really matter so much, as long as you use Browserify or something that does it that, like that, I should say. And you can create uh, a writable streams or readable streams or, or through streams or duplex streams, whatever you like, readable or writable or both. And we can, so for instance, this is just a, a server example. And here we, we've got our multiple data channels. And we'll just pipe uh, from this giant dictionary file I have in my computer. And we'll, we'll cut out Etsy password also, just for, for fun. <laughs> Don't worry, that, that hasn't been a problem for like hundreds of years. Whoops. <laughs> By which I mean like 20 years. And um, so all we have to do, whoops, this is a network example. That's why. This one, three. So we do this, and oh no, I don't even have that in the local directory. Well, anyways, it, it multiplexes the, the stream into a single stream, in, in this case, process that standard out. What's really cool is because it is just a stream, we can use this over a server connection, which will be important in a minute. I'm building to something here. Um, so we, we can pipe our server just by doing that. Instead of process.standard out, we pipe to a server. Cool. Ah, and we can give our streams names. So like in, in Socket.io, for instance, you might know the, uh, the, the event names. You can create like different channels and things. But it's sort of like added on. And it's, it's, you have to really buy into that ecosystem of, of architecture. But with, with tools like this, you can really just, as, as long as you have a stream in the first place, um, layer on additional, connection, er, additional abstractions. So and what's really cool is, um, the code we can write is just really not very complicated also. Um, so I was thinking about what my last example would be. And it turns out, yesterday, I was at this amazing thing called NodeCopter. And it's really great, because um, 
I was, without even thinking about it, using a lot of the same abstractions that I've, that I've just been talking about. So let's write, whoops, let's write uh, a, a helicopter control system that will connect, that will um, also be a website that we can view image data on, and it will do color detection. So the first part, the color detection, is actually really easy. And we can just do this as a simple module that just does one thing. So let's do that. So the first thing is we can use Node on the server with the canvas to, to just get the pixels in the first place. So we'll pass uh, the width and the height and a buffer of, of image data to this, and it will We'll draw it for us. Cool. So you can get the array. Um, well, it's not quite an array, but it's like a data array of all of the things that you need for it. And this is the simplest possible algorithm that could work for detecting color red, for instance, like a matador's cape. It's, it's red, and our helicopter can detect colors. But all we have to do is actually just sum up all of the colors in the image. Here we go. Uh, and the easiest way to do that, I think, is to convert to HSL first. So you take the RGB pixels, you convert them down to, to HSL, and you get the hue and the saturation and the luminosity. And with that, we can just write a silly little function that, that uh, detects the ranges of the colors. So the hues within a certain value and the, the saturation has to be you know, so high, over 30, we'll say. And then the luminosity you know, has to be, it can't be too dark and it can't be too light. So we'll just count those, and that'll be a threshold. So that's all we need to do color detection. The really cool thing is, got this working in like 10 minutes with training data. So um, here I'll just run the training set. So those, I those values are uh, false, true, true, false. And here I'll show you the images. So that one should be false, true, because it's got red in it, true, and false, because it has red but not enough. So that part was easy. The next part is, is a bit harder. So this is just the, the training example, right? It's just like not very much code. And we're just layering these abstractions on each other. So nothing is ever very much code. Um, what's cool about this is, well, first, we can make an HTTP server now. And uh, let's see, you know, just serve up some static files. And we can use shoe to just create a stream. And uh, we can fill this in uh, with mux demux to do our multiplexing. So we'll need a, a few different types of data going over our communication channel. So here, um, we're just setting up with a, this is called the duplex stream. That's where you take uh, a stream and pipe it to another remote thing and then pipe the results back into your abstraction. But we can use that emit the emit stream abstraction that I was talking about earlier to make an event emitter API. And so this is kind of nice because uh, the air drone stuff that Felix wrote lets us, let's see, as soon as we um, hook up all of the plumbing for the emit stream, yeah, here we go. We can take the air drone, and we can actually, um, well, disable the emergency functionality, first of all, <laughs> of course. And um, we can actually just create a PNG stream and get PNGs out. And then we can use our other abstraction to actually pipe here we go, here's our detect algorithm, and we'll pipe each of the PNG images as they arrive into our detection. Then we can do all kinds of crazy stuff, like, um, let's see, what should we do? Like, I don't know, well, we can emit some events so the browser can read them, but we can also zoom forward at full speed <laughs> and blink the LEDs. How about, that'll be, that'll be pretty fun. So. Yeah, and then we'll turn them off again after a second because we don't want it to like crash into whatever, like a wall or a person or a table or some drinks or, or whatever. Um, so in the browser, though, and here, why don't I connect? Um, make sure that I can actually connect to this thing. Oh, excellent. OK, so uh, the browser side of this is not complicated either. And what's really cool is because all of these streaming modules just do their one thing and do it well, we can just use uh, Browserify to make all of this code work in the browser with the same libraries, which is really excellent. So we can use uh, shoe and emit stream and mux demux in our browser code, just like we, we do in the server. And just to show you, like, <laughs> we're actually in the browser. This isn't, this isn't Node here. We're, we're doing query selectors and things. And, and uh, here I've got a, a crosshairs image, so we can superimpose that 
on the actual webcam data. It's, it's really cool if, if it works. And um, we're, so on, on the server side, um, it's actually emitting an image event that gives us the entire buffer and, and converts it to base64. And we can just throw that in the image, which is, is pretty fun. And here's the, the part that does the crosshairs. So once we have all of those things in place, um, all you have to do is just hook up the plumbing, right? Because it's just a really simple abstraction. So this whole thing is, is not very complicated. And, um, but suppose later that we actually want to, um, want to drive it, right? Because like, it, it shouldn't just be totally autonomous, because that, that's hard algorithm, and it's not quite as interesting. So uh, the really cool thing about streaming abstractions and modules that just do their one thing really well is that we can hook them up. Um, whoops. Ah, all right, this is the browser code. Yeah, we can hook up uh, streaming abstractions like Dnode to do RPC for our, our crazy robot example here. So we'll require Dnode and um, just uh, hook Dnode into our plumbing, first of all, with um, some pipes. And uh, can list out all of the methods that we need to um, to proxy in, into the the air drone API, and then it's just a matter of let's see, oh yeah, then it's just a matter of um, well doing a little hacky thing because they're on the prototype instead of object um, objects you can get with object .keys, but we can just plug that into our machinery over Mux Dmux, and now we have our event. Our, our emit stream event emitter abstraction, and we have our denote abstraction for doing RPC. So we've got both of these things in there, and they just layer on each other really well. So let's see. There's more browser stuff that's not important at all. Oh, yeah, and we just hook it in. It's, it's pretty easy stuff. So that is it. And now, oh, yeah, it's on. Here it is. Here's the real one. <laughs> OK. so. We're connected, and we can go to this web page. It just uses all these streaming abstractions, and we have a video feed and everything. Make it a bit bigger. So um, the thing I didn't show is the keyboard controls, but that's just like a 20-line script. And so I just took, I just hit a button that does the takeoff command, and you guys should be able to see the video stream here. So I'll go forward a bit, slowly. Go up a little. So um, you remember that image detection stuff, right? Dominic, if you would. Here, Dominic has some red. Oh, shit, it's targeting. <laughs> Whoa, no. OK. Sorry, guys. OK. So uh, here, we're, we're getting close again. And uh, let's see if enough pixels. Whoa. Do we have enough pixels? Oh, shit. <laughs> and so with a little bit of Unix philosophy and some nice design aesthetics, we can make a Matador helicopter drone of doom. I'm just going to keep flying this until you kick me off stage, so. <laughs> Not that I want to distract him, but does anyone have any questions for Substack? Yeah, I don't think that's not a question, but yes, absolutely. What the fruit stuck? I've been. Uh, why don't you think? You can use streams in like the browser. Like the presentation before this one was about web audio, right? But why isn't there a streaming API for web audio? 
Like, uh, like why, why, are, why are streams just for Node developers right now? Why are streams just for Node developers? Well, they shouldn't be. We've had streams, actually, in Unix for the longest time, since the 60s, actually. Um, I don't know. Streams are one of those abstractions that we just kind of see again and again. And they sort of, they, they're like describing something more fundamental to computing. And that's doing I.O. really well. And just doing asynchronous I.O. especially, where you, you have pieces that just need to talk to each other. And you have to like move data from one place to the other place. And I think that streams are just a really good API. And they shouldn't just be for Node. And they shouldn't just be for things that look a lot like Node, like I do with, with some browser stuff. So I don't even know if I answered your question, Max, but I, I, I said some words. It was a loaded question, so I think, I think that'll be sufficient. Anyone else? Lizzie? No? Going once, going twice? All right. Thank you, man.